Okay, we just spent several videos looking at the head capsule and the important parts of the head capsule. Now we're just going to spend one very quick video looking at the thorax. If you remember, all insects have those three major body regions, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The thorax is the center most body region as, and is considered the center of locomotion. This is because it houses both the legs and the wings in those insects that have legs and wings. In order to support the movement of legs and wings, the thorax has to be very, very rigid. So it is especially sclerotized. It has lots of sutures, lots of internal places for muscle attachment to happen, and a lot of internal structural support to uh, help keep up the support of all this stuff and the movement of all this stuff. The thorax is divided into three major regions, the prothorax, the mesothorax, and the metathorax. As these names suggest, the prothorax is at this frontal most portion, or is that frontal most segment of the thorax. The mesothorax, meso means middle, is that middle segment, and the metathorax, meta means behind, is that final segment. So pro first, meso middle, uh, meta behind three major segments in this thoracic region. When we're talking about the different surfaces of the thorax, we're going to call the dorsal surface of the thorax by two names. We either call it the tergum or the notum. So you're going to find different resources talking about the thorax using different names, but they mean the same thing. So whenever you see tergum or notum, uh, you're going to look on that thoracic region, especially it says the thoracic tergum, thoracic nor notum. Okay, that's that dorsal surface. The ventral surface of the thorax is called the sternum. Think about that. You've got a sternum on your ventral thoracic region, right? So same exact idea of that uh, of the insect. So that ventral surface is called the sternum, and the lateral surfaces of the thorax are called the pleura or singular pleuron. So dorsal tergum or notum, ventral sternum, and lateral pleuron. These different names are actually really, really useful. Uh, they can help us pinpoint exactly where we're talking about when we're talking about the thorax. Now, you're going to see this a lot when you are looking at the keys in lab, but this is sort of the general terminology that we use. You want to keep in mind, though, that this doesn't apply to all insects. When we have a general terminology like this, it means that in most insects we use this, but there are some specialized terms for some specialized insects, and you're just going to have to sort of get to know that when you get to those specialized insects. But in general, this is how we talk about things. We can pinpoint these areas using the uh, uh, the mix of the pro, meta, and mesothoracic segments, and then that notum, sternum, and plural surfaces, or pleuron. So in this case, uh, the pro notum is found on the dorsal surface of the prothorax. So it's right up top here. So dorsal surface prothorax is the pro notum. The mesonotum is on that uh, media, that dorsal surface in that median or medial region, right? So that middle um, or mesothoracic area. So mesonotum and then metanotum is that last segment on the dorsal surface. The uh, <clears throat> propleuron, that is the lateral side, lateral surface of the uh, prothoracic region. The mesopleuron, uh, lateral surface of the mesothoracic region, and the um, metapleuron is the third segment in that uh, thoracic region, on the side of that thoracic region. So the sides here. Now, every once in a while, somebody will ask me, okay, so if you're talking about the propleuron, uh, how do I know which side to look on left or right? Remember, insects have bilateral symmetry, right? So it should be a mirror image on each side. So if you say pl pro pleuron, you can look at either side. It'll be the same or approximately the same. They'll have the same major structures there. Finally, the sternal area, the prosternum, is on that ventral region of that first thoracic um, segment. The uh, mesosternum, that middle region of that uh, 
of that thoracic region, that uh, sternal region, and the metasternum is that third thoracic segment in that sternal or in that uh, ventral region. Now, all adult insects have these legs. These legs are found on the pleural or the sternal area of the thorax. So depending on exactly where that insertion is, it can be officially on the lateral surfaces or on the ventral surface of these insects. Now, what is consistent is that each uh, segment, the prothoracic region, the mesothoracic region, and the metathoracic region, each house one pair of legs. So remember that all insects have these uh, six legs or three pairs of legs um, total. And so the prothoracic region sports two legs, meso, two legs, and meta, two legs, one per uh, thoracic segment. Now, all legs have five major segments. The proximal most segment, the segment that is closest to the thoracic uh, region or the body wall, is called the coxa. So the coxa actually attaches to the thorax. Uh, then that coxa on the other end will attach to the trochanter, which will attach to the femur, the tibia, and then the tarsus. So it goes coxa, trochanter, femur, tibia, tarsus. Coxa, trochanter, femur, tibia, tarsus. So all of the insect legs have these same exact regions in this order. Um, the tarsus in some species may be segmented. In other species, it may be just a single hook. Just depends on the life history. And in different species, the number of segments in the tarsus is a characteristic that will help you identify that particular species. So in lab, you may be asked to count the number of segments in the tarsus in order to get down to the species level. Just know you need to look at that most uh, distal portion of the leg and count up the segments. So coxa, trochanter, femur, tibia, tarsus. Now, all insects and closely related arthropods have all of these segments in their legs. Okay, they're attached to that thoracic body region. But just like the mouth parts, you may see some massive modifications in one way or another based on evolutionary pressures and based on life history. The blister beetle, for example, up at the top here, this blister beetle has a pretty straightforward leg. Um, it's this uh, running type of leg, you'll see the coxy is basically of normal size. Uh, the trochanter is a moderate sized trochanter. The femur, femur is a long, but not especially bulbous. The tibia is long. And you have several segments in your trochanter, or I'm sorry, in your uh, tarsus, right? So femur, trochanter, sorry, coxa, trochanter, femur, tibia, tarsus. Okay, so it looks pretty straightforward used for running, that sort of thing. Compare that to the hind leg here of the cat flea. In this case, you have a much larger, much more robust coxal region and a reduced trochanter. The femur is shorter, but it's also much fatter. So these areas are uh, or help to store energy and provide energy for those really big jumps that you know that fleas do. The tibia is a little bit shorter and the tarsus is a longit with many segments. This allows for grasping onto things. So you see some modifications here. You get some massive modifications when we get to lice. So you got the human body louse and the human pubic louse. So here you've got sort of this smaller, shorter, stumpy type of, um, of coxy. Uh, the trochanter, sort of medium size. Look how small the femur is, though, in comparison. It is really, really reduced. While the tibia looks really strange. Actually, I got this bifurcation of the tibia here to form a hook-like or a, a claw-like thing that allows for grasping. And then the tarsus is just a single claw-like segment or thorn-like segment. So what this does is this allows for opening and closing of this claw here to grasp onto hair. And if you look at this, the relative size of these claws, you have a much smaller, much thinner claw in the human body louse and a much more thick claw in the pubic louse. This is because the hairs and things that the human body louse attaches onto uh, are much smaller and thinner than the pubic hair that the human pubic louse attaches onto. So you can look at the size of the claws and get an idea of the diameter of, say, the, the hair or the thing that these lice hang onto. So that is super useful in trying to figure out what they're feeding on, right? 
Now, when we get to the ticks and the mites, things get even weirder. So we have some extra organs that are attached here. We have some extra segments going on here, but the same basic idea holds true. You got your coxy at the base, Next comes the trochanter, then the femur, then in the mite, you have this sort of extra segment here, then the tibia, the tarsus, then another extra segment down the bottom. I won't make you memorize those two extra segments, but know that there are a couple of extra things in there. So here's your basic mite right here. Look how thin that is comparing to the insects. A very, very thin. Same thing with the ticks very thin. In this mite here, look how crazy everything looks. You got this widened coxal region, much more robust trochanter. The femur sort of has this weird divot and hook in there. Um, these, uh, this extra segment here uh, is makes sort of an elbow-like shape. The tibia is really short and thick. The tarsus has like a paddle on the end. So this is a mite that can grasp onto fur. And then the scabies mite, really huge coxy. Everything else is super, super reduced. Okay, so this has these little terminal suckers on the end to attach to skin. So you see that the segments are there. They're just modified in one way, shape, or form. So when you see this in a key, know exactly where you are looking. All right, the second major organ of um, movement found on the thorax are the wings in insects. Now, they may uh, be present in insects. Uh, in some insects, though, there are no wings whatsoever. So having wings isn't a prerequisite for insects. That's why we didn't have that in those three major things that make up insects, right? Okay, so these wings are often found more dorsally than the legs, but there are on their own um, body segments or thoracic segments. Now, in general, wings are a hallmark of adult insects. They're primarily found fully formed on mature specimens. So those that have gone through their life cycle, they're in that mating stage, they need to move around. That's when we find the wings. We won't find fully formed wings necessarily on most young insects, but we'll go over that when I go over the life cycle. Now, usually winged insects have two pairs of wings. There's one pair on the mesothorax known as the forewings, and there's one pair on the metathorax known as the hind wings. So the middle and the uh, back section of the thorax have wings. Now, wings tend to be very slender, and they have these quote-unquote veins. These are actually tracheal tubes, but they're veins um, for strength. So that's what makes up all this patterning that you see here on the wings. Okay, right around here. See all that pattern? Those are those quote unquote veins that allow for strength for the wings. Um, these veins all have names because of course they do. And the cells made up by the veins. So if you got the veins here, is it like say this is the CUA1 vein and together with this M14 vein, you have a cell right here. Okay, so these cells also have names. This is ridiculously important when it comes to identification of species. You are going to get maps of these veins that all have different names, and you're going to have to look at the relative size and shape and, and branching, and if there's hairs on these veins and all of that sort of stuff in order to help identify particular species. Now, <clears throat> The insects that have wings may or may not have lost them uh, at some time in their life cycle. They may have grown them at certain times, but there are some groups of insects that um, do not have wings as adults at all. <clears throat> some primitive insects um, never had wings. They evolved from a, an insect ancestor that didn't have wings in any way, and so they don't have even the space for wings. It's something like silverfish, and you've seen these running around your house. Very ancient species. Uh, they have never had wings. Other species secondarily lost wings. This means that they evolved from a species with wings, but they uh, tried to exploit a niche where wings became more of a liability than a help. So things like fleas, okay, they evolved from a winged species, but as they got into being in animal hair and running around uh, fur and that sort of thing, wings, if you might imagine, will get caught in all of that and would cause a lot of problems. So these things are running around. They ended up uh, 
doing better when they didn't have those wings. So they secondarily lost those wings after having evolved with them. So this can give you an idea of uh, the types of wing adaptation that we see. So when I say they usually have two pairs of wings, this is because wings to some extent are modified based on these insect orders. So up at the top here, you can see several insect groups that actually have two obvious wings. The butterflies are probably the most obvious when it comes to wings. Here are those four wings or those mesothoracic wings. Here are the hind wings or the metathoracic wings. Okay, they're attached to that thoracic region and we know butterflies because they're big and beautiful and pretty and all those sorts of things there. Here are uh, dragonflies. They're very obvious wings, mesothoracic, metathoracic. They're really, really big. You can see these obvious veins in them okay? and uh, they just sort of stick straight out nice and clear. This here are the wings of bees. Uh, and so you've got these really large forewings or mesothoracic wings and a little bit smaller when it comes to the metathoracic wings. Okay? But they have obvious two pairs of wings. Now, things get weird in some other orders or some other groups when we see some major modifications. Some insects, their forewings are highly, highly sclerotized. They're highly modified into shells, uh, into what we call elytra. So these elytra are these hard, uh, highly modified, highly sclerotized forewings that fold back over the hind wings of this insect and protect these nice membranous hind wings. So you see these a lot in beetles. The same type of modification can happen in, happen in some true bugs when the forewings, instead of being fully sclerotized, they're more leathery in texture. So they give sort of a skin-like structure, but they're also used as protection for the membranous hind wings. Now in flies, you have these really robust forewings, but the hindwings, see this little tiny nubbin thing down here? It's this little tiny hindwing. It's a highly, highly reduced hindwing. Okay, so that is a high modification of that hindwing that is used for a slightly different purpose than like trying to get air, trying to flap around and um, get lift in that case. All right. So that was the basic overview of the thorax. Uh, this last lecture, last lesson is going to be a very quick one about the uh, minor uh, characteristics or the, ex the minor important characteristics of the abdomen of the insect. Talk to me, talk to you soon. Let me know if you have any questions.